As many as 40% of Americans believe in a global flood, usually the literal story of Noah. But what if I showed you how we know for an absolute fact that this story never happened? Young Earth creationists who hold to a literal Bible love to cast doubt on science by saying things like, When we're talking about origins, we're talking about the past. We're talking about our origins. We weren't there. You can't observe that. Before encouraging their viewers to believe in a book written ages after the events it describes by other people who weren't there. But unlike the authors of the Bible, science can give us a window into the past. Just like a crime scene investigation, we can examine clues to find out what actually happened in our long forgotten in history. Now, I'm not going to focus on the reasons why Noah's Ark would be physically impossible. I'll cover that in part two. But in this video, we're going to explore 12 pieces of evidence that blast a cannonball sized hole in the global flood narrative and show us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the earth was not covered entirely with water. Number one, ice cores. In permanently frozen parts of Antarctica and Greenland, snow and ice layers get deposited and compressed every single year. The chemistry of Earth's atmosphere fluctuates throughout the year, and we can measure this in the ice core layers by slowly melting the core onto a metal plate and measuring the exact chemical makeup of each layer. The primary dating chemical we're using is from sea salt. So we're using sodium magnesium. Okay. To get a beautiful signal. That, uh, shows every annual layer. From summer bubbles to winter dust, we can clearly see, measure, and count annual layers similarly to how you would count tree rings, except much more precisely. Some of the elements that we measure, we measure in parts per quadrillion, and to visualize that or to get a feel for what that actually means is we're looking for a second in 30, Three million years. Scientists also measure annual fluctuations in acidity using electrodes. So we have three different ways of measuring these ice cores. Some of these cores at Vostok and Dome C go back 800,000 years, showing normal seasonal variations with no chaotic slurry layer or any other evidence of a catastrophic global flood. Number two, lake barbs. Just like with ice cores, certain peaceful lakes like Japan's Sugetsu will deposit alternating light, dark sediment pairs every single year based on the season. Again, counting them is like counting tree rings. There are over 52,000 of them, unbroken, undisturbed, and entirely flood-free. Number three, dendrochronology. Most young earth creationists place the flood at about 2348 BC, but we have single standalone trees older than that, which have been continuously growing undisturbed for 4,900 years. And we have significantly older tree colonies like the Pando Aspen colony in Utah that's been consistently growing for over 10,000 years none of which would have survived a year underwater. They didn't drown, they didn't restart from a seed, and they sure as hell didn't sprout on an ark. Number four, archeology. span We literally have cities that have been continuously occupied since before the flood allegedly took place. Hell, Jericho has occupation going back 12,000 years. Apparently all of these civilizations were trading and waging war and farming and perfecting pyramid building techniques and yet somehow never got the memo that they were supposed to be underwater? Number five. Coral reefs. Coral reefs only grow a couple of millimeters a year. And like trees, we can measure annual growth. You split them open and you x-ray them and they're like trees. People are very familiar with tree rings that you can count the tree rings and go back in time. Well, the corals produce these annual bands. We've taken drill cores from coral and the Great Barrier Reef, which show continuous growth phases going back more than 400,000 years. But corals occupy a very fragile ecosystem. Change their temperature ever so slightly, they die. Change the salinity or pH level of the ocean, they die. If you were to pump the ocean full of muddy freshwater chaos for even a week, much less a year, they wouldn't stand a chance. Number six, speleothems. Every year, stalactites in caves slowly grow. Extremely slowly. Drip by drip, 
the calcium deposits build up, forming measurable isotope stripes preserved in chronological order. If a global flood had churned the planet into a muddy blender, these fragile speleothems would have snapped like spaghetti. Instead, at caves in the Alps and in Carlsbad caverns, these perfectly preserved structures have stood pristine for over 500,000 years. Number seven, genetics. We can precisely measure a species' genes, and based on genetic diversity, determine if that species almost went extinct, and if so, how long ago? Cheetahs, for example, were nearly wiped out 10,000 years ago, and now every single cheetah is practically an identical twin. Now, if every single species on Earth had a genetic bottleneck of just two members, followed by generations of inbreeding, that's what we would expect to see in every animal's DNA test. Instead, with the vast majority of species alive today, we see the exact opposite. Massive genetic diversity across a species. Number eight dirt. The soil beneath your feet contains an incredibly diverse balance of bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. These organisms play essential roles in nutrient cycling, in decomposing organic matter, and in plant health. Without them, nothing would be able to grow. These specialized soil biomes and the complex microorganism communities that they contain would have been devastated by prolonged flooding. It would have taken years of rainfall just to purge enough salt from the soil for plants to be able to grow again. And studies of similarly devastated soil now exposed by receding glaciers have found that it takes 50 to 150 years for the soil microbiomes to be able to recover enough for bushes and trees to be able to start growing again. The thought of Noah finding a fully formed olive branch just 40 days after peak flooding is absolutely laughable. Number nine, the water itself. There's no viable mechanism to explain where all the flood water came from or where it went afterwards. If you added enough water to cover every inch of land, including the top of Mount Everest, that would require over three times the amount of water currently on earth. Where did all that water go? Because it ain't here. Number 10, written records. We have continuous written records and archeological data going back over a thousand years before the flood allegedly took place. Oh, and in multiple languages. So the Tower of Babel is BS as well. Number 11, geology. Even small local floods are easy to detect in the geological column because they leave behind not only chemical signatures, but also a very noticeable bluish layer of glade soil. And yet despite geologists drilling extensively on every single continent, there is absolutely no global flood layer. Number 12, flood myths. Different civilizations around the world have completely different flood myths, with vastly differing dates and details and descriptions suggesting that these were localized floods rather than a single giant global event. The flood myth in the Bible borrows almost whole cloth from the older Mesopotamian flood myths of the people who conquered them. The flood myths in the Sumerian epic of Ziasudra predate the book of Genesis by over a thousand years. But I know what you're thinking. What about fish fossils on mountaintops? Well, this is something very well understood by scientists. You see, tectonic plates, the same geological plates that rub together and cause earthquakes, can slowly push together, rising upwards to form mountains. It's why the Himalayas continue to rise at a slow, gradual rate every single year, about five millimeters a year, but over time, that adds up. Layers of rock that were once submerged below the ocean have slowly been forced upwards, which is why fossils that were once below the water are now on mountains. The past tells a story. History leaves fingerprints and screams to us if we know how to listen. And if we know how to look, every single field of science destroys the story of Noah's Ark. There is absolutely zero evidence of a global flood and a boatload of evidence against it. And it's not just that there's no evidence of it happening. Noah's undertaking itself wouldn't just be difficult. It would be scientifically impossible. But we're going to have to cover that in part two. Check out my next video covering all of the reasons why Noah's Ark would be utterly impossible. Thanks for watching. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.